Death is careless at times. It confuses love with a wet afternoon in an empty room. The unpainted walls a reminder of how sex can resemble poverty. A hollow cry. An open mouth falling inside as you sleep. I prepare my heart and language with better words. Like worlds in small selves I've built. Every month, one dollar buys me one brick. But how many bricks does it take to build a house? A stray dog barks late at night. I can't see him, but know he's there. He reminds me that here, dreams have dangerous turns. I turn around to no one naked beside me. I play it safe not to see the fire in my hands. But let us be clear, I'm no beggar. It's just that there are times when the world is a sound that cripples the air and the soul. When what seems arranged, glazing and strange, like music played on tin cans, turns into wilting noise, when suddenly all that exists is a small boy trying to focus on the pain lifting a nation. A telephone call. He was wearing black shoes, a Calvin Klein t-shirt that he found in a hotel trash, brown slacks. She was wearing one earring on her right ear, one sock on her left foot, a dress the colour of sky. She bought him a can of souk. He pulled her close, said, t chérie. And after they promised to meet later, she winked and walked leisurely in the shade. A tremble followed. When he turned around, her body was one of a thousand on the streets. He ran towards her, stood by her arm, unable to see her face. The call drops. I begin to count the ways I tolerate my dry mouth, to count the glasses of water I gave away to make up for my sins. But this act does not count when we fall out of our hearts. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each week, I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is The Act of Counting by Natalie Handel. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere so that you can read along. If you have trouble finding one, there's a link to it down below in the description. Natalie Handel is a poet quite unlike most of her peers. To describe her as just a poet would be a disservice, as she is also a world-renowned translator and advocate for immigrant rights. She brings about a depth of sincerity and emotion that is hard to rival in her verse. The journalist Laurianne Williams has said of her, Natalie Handel is a singular creature, an international nomad, whose work explores the innermost quadrants of the self and has a genius for letting all voices, however discordant, be heard. This is poetry of the most original and rigorous kind. International Nomad is an apt title. Born in Haiti to a Palestinian family, Handal has lived in Europe, Latin America, the Arab world, and the United States. As I said, International Poet doesn't really cover how much experience and perspective she manages to encapsulate in her work. As Adam stated, she seems to have a genius for letting all voices be heard. When asked to describe her own work, she once wrote, My preoccupations and the questions in my writing are formed by my identity. Born in the Caribbean, but not entirely from there, Latin American, but not entirely, European, but not entirely, Asian, but not entirely, Middle Eastern, but not until my adult life could I say Palestinian without distress. A French and American citizen, but always being asked where I come from originally. Why couldn't I be entirely from all these places, including their literary spaces? This struggle for identity is present in all her work and seems timely in our modern world. 
This poem comes from her collection, The Republics, which came out in 2015. The collection is centered around Haiti and the Dominican Republic and deals with both countries as they attempt to rebuild in the wake of the devastating earthquake of 2010. The book is an attempt to find a voice for the countless masses who were displaced by the state of emergency that took hold there. Its poems tackle the loss of place and power through things like racism, poverty and disaster. Centered around that notion of giving voice to others, much of the book is written from somebody else's point of view as opposed to Handel's. It's worth noting that this poem, The Act of Counting, is a prose poem. That is to say, it's a poem that mimics the structure and layout of a traditional piece of prose writing. The prose poem tends to incorporate the best of both forms. It has all the device and imagery of poetry, whilst maintaining the freedom and descriptive depth of prose. It is often used as a means of creating a very vivid sense of place, and that is something that is exceptionally important to Handel as a poet. We can feel that vivid sense of place being built from the opening section I've chosen. Death is careless at times. It confuses love with a wet afternoon in an empty room. The unpainted walls a reminder of how sex can resemble poverty. A hollow cry. An open mouth falling inside as you sleep. I prepare my heart and language with better words like worlds in small selves I've built. Every month, one dollar buys me one brick. But how many bricks does it take to build a house? From the very first sentence, a strong sense of personification takes hold, and we're made aware that this is a poem that has no time for strict realism. Death is given a sense of personality. It is an easily muddled thing. Handel's imagery slips from one flash to the next. Sex and poverty intertwine, much like the act the words are describing. And suddenly, there is pain and longing in the image of an open mouth falling inside you as you sleep. There is a torrent of imagery here, a barrage of emotion, that leaves the listener feeling more than a little rocked. There are hints of realism at work in the empty rooms and unpainted walls, which act like an anchor point, keeping the reader tethered to some familiar sense of reality. Knowing what we know of the collection, we can guess that this is a reference to a dilapidated building in Haiti. The onslaught of imagery continues then, as our unknown speaker talks of their resilience in the face of this death and poverty. I prepare my heart and language with better words. The heart needs encouragement, steeling itself against the hardships it faces, while the better words of language will save our speaker from society. Throughout much of her work, Handal speaks of how important language is for acceptance, and how the poor and displaced must struggle when they are thrust into a new surrounding, how it can rob them of dignity, and how it makes others look down on them if they do not master new language. We, the reader, realize that our speaker needs this language, possibly for his job. They are attempting to rebuild their life. Every month, one dollar buys me one brick. But how many months does it take to build a house? The near Herculean task our speaker is undertaking is laid bare in those lines. The economic Everest he is attempting to summit is made clear. He wants to rebuild his home the one that has been so quickly taken from him. Handal immediately returns to scene setting in the next section. A stray dog barks late at night. I can't see him, but know he's there. He reminds me that here, dreams have dangerous turns. I turn around to no one naked beside me. I play it safe not to see the fire in my hands. But let us be clear, I'm no beggar. It's just that there are times when the world is a sound that cripples the air and the soul. When what seems arranged, glazing and strange, like music played on tin cans, turns into wilting noise. When suddenly, all that exists is a small boy trying to focus on the pain of a nation. Here. The lack of security and fear a refugee must feel is explored. 
The stray dog becomes a symbol for all the unknown fears of life. Our speaker cannot see what dangers await, but they are very aware that much like the dog, they are always out there. He reminds me that here, dreams have dangerous turns, is a line filled with dual meanings. It is a clear reference to the fact that our speaker is slipping in and out of dreaming. But they also speak of the fact that people wait to prey on refugees and asylum seekers at every turn. This is another of Handel's favourite techniques, exploring the perils of the world from a liminal space, a point where two worlds collide in such an area. Dangers she is attempting to document can take on a larger than life form. It gives her language the freedom to expand and turn more poetic and surreal. Having woken from their sleep, our speaker finds that they are alone, with no one naked beside them. This further compounds the notion that even the simple pleasures are denied to those in exile or estranged. It is yet another form of comfort and safety they do not have access to. The line, I play it safe not to see the fire in my hands, is difficult to decipher. But given the joy Handel takes in working with other languages and their references, with a little bit of digging, we can discover what she means. Having researched it, I take it to be a reference to the Spanish idiom, putting your hand in the fire for someone. It was a way of proving innocence long ago. If an innocent man or woman placed their hand in the fire, then God would spare them from being burnt. However, should the person be guilty, they would burn. Such tests of virtue were commonly known as ordeals. They were extremely common during the Crusades. Our speaker dare not be put to such a test, and so they keep their nose clean, never stooping to illegal acts to fulfill this need to rebuild. The resilience of the speaker reasserts itself, but let us be clear, I'm no beggar. Their dignity rallies. Then, as if in response, their hardship takes on an ornate beauty, an almost orchestral elegance. It's just that there are times when the world is a sound that cripples the air and the soul. When what seems arranged, glazing and strange, like music played on tin cans, turns into wilting noise. Handel's mastery of crystal clear imagery takes over and we can almost feel the noise she describes in our ears. Our speaker rationalizes his hardship. There are times when the world cripples you. Handel begins to weave reality and metaphor into one again as we understand that not only is their internal world being laid low, but their physical one as well. The imagery of arranged music, glazing and strange, played on tin cans is a reference to the fact that life has a pattern but it is one of chaos and strangeness. On the other hand, the physical aspect is the earthquake that struck Haiti. Then our speaker's identity is fleshed out a little more as we come to understand him as a man, or rather, a boy. I think this is a reference to the helpless feeling he has experienced in the face of such a cataclysmic event. The poem shifts from the present to the past, as the tragedy of the speaker is revealed in full. A telephone call. He was wearing black shoes, a Calvin Klein t-shirt that he found in a hotel trash, brown slacks. She was wearing one earring on her right ear, one sock on her left foot, a dress the color of sky. She bought him a can of soup. He pulled her close, said T. Cherie. And after they promised to meet later, she winked and walked leisurely in the shade. Joy has suddenly found its way into this piece. The telephone call moves us from the first person perspective of the speaker to a third party observer. A love story is told to us, but more importantly, a fact is established. These people were poor before the disaster. These people had nothing in life to lose. Both of them wear clothes they found in other people's rubbish. Despite this, they are happy. They go through the flirtations and courtship of any young couple. 
She gives him a simple cane treat, which I have to apologize for in terms of my pronunciation. He pulls her close and whispers sweet nothings to her. Finally, they plan their future together. She walks away carefree. Her passing into the shade is an ominous bit of foreshadowing in an almost literal sense. These lines are filled with vitality. The listing technique in the descriptions of their clothing helps to add a quickened pace to the lines, moving the reader quicker through these lines. There is no unease here, no decayed room, no dogs hiding in the darkness. And it's because of this that the final section is so crushing. A tremble followed. When he turned around, her body was one of a thousand on the streets. He ran towards her, stood by her arm, unable to see her face, the call drops. I begin to count the ways I tolerate my dry mouth, to count the glasses of water I gave away to make up for my sins. But this act does not count when we fall out of our hearts. Handal pays homage to the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice here, the famous Greek hero who rescued his wife from Hades, only to turn around and have her snatched from him once more. The tragedies in both these cases seem equal. Our speaker's love is gone, just one among many. The word thousands here hits heavy. He runs towards her in an act of protection, attempted all too late. The dreamlike liminal state is reasserted here as he is unable to see her face. Suddenly, the call drops. The memory ends. Or is it a nightmare? Our point of view is once again the speaker's. We understand more now about this man. He is not alone, but in refuge among many. There is a heavy guilt in his heart. He is attempting atonement through the only thing he has available to him, sacrifice. His dry mouth comes to mean so much. Physical thirst and longing, fear and loss. And so he begins to count, to take stock, the glasses of water he gave away, a reference to offers of water he declined for himself so as to give it to others, a small attempt to assuage the guilt he feels. Sadly, he makes it clear that nothing can mend a heart that has lost so much. Nothing can return us to the past when we fall out of our own hearts. Through this poem, we come to understand just how little some people have in life, and yet, in some cruel way, how much they can still lose in the blink of an eye. So why this poem? Natalie Handel never fails to move me. Her use of language has an ability to sweep me along with it. I find myself caught up in her words, rarely registering their meaning on a first reading, and yet always feeling them intensely. This poem showcases that feeling beautifully. It can be difficult to feel the plight of refugees and asylum seekers in a human way. We often see their difficulties through the lens of statistics and news reports, which are distant and cold at times. Handel will not allow this. She provides a whole human life in one block of text. She creates a human avatar for the immigrant experience in her speaker. We as listeners feel their loss, experience their fear, and shirk back from their alienation. She has committed herself to documenting such pain so that the world cannot look away. In her own words, the aches of exile are unremitting. Such sadness finds relief in words. I think this poem does a wonderful job of making sure people bear witness whilst also bringing comfort to those who are witnessed. What's your reading of the poem? I'd like to point out, as always, that this is my interpretation. If you'd like to talk to me about it, you can reach me in a few ways. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find me on my website at wordsthatburnpodcast.com. There you'll find the show notes for this episode, complete with references to everything researched. If none of that suits you, I'm on Instagram. Just search Words That Burn Podcast. 
I upload bonus material like study guides and quotations there. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please consider giving me a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music in this week's episode is by Scott Buckley and is used under Creative Commons license. That's all from me this week. Thank you very, very much again. And hopefully you'll hear from me again soon.